Here is Mark Arnaldo filming from GenCon 2016 and today I'm very, very excited to be sitting now with one of the fathers of modern role-playing games with Ken St. Andre, who is the inventor of Tunnels and Trolls, which is the second role-playing game that was ever created. Thank you, Ken, for taking the time to chat with me and with my viewers. So. Marco, it's my pleasure to chat with you and your viewers. Um, what would you like to know? Well, for I, I am personally very interested in the history of role-playing games and I have been looking into that and I'm actually writing a book about interactive fiction so I know about the origins of tunnels and trolls how it came to be but but I like to hear the story from you can you tell us again how did you come up with this crazy idea in the 70s of creating a role-playing game yes I'd be happy to oh. December 1974 I began to hear about this fabulous new game that people were playing in other parts of the country called Dungeons and Dragons. It sounded like something I would love. I was a big fantasy fan. I was a fan of Tolkien, of Moorcock, of Fritz Leiber. Um, I knew some of them in person, Fritz said. Uh, and uh, I was a big, big fantasy fan. I collected it. And I want a game that was all about that kind of fiction uh, sounded like something I had to have. But it wasn't in Phoenix, which is my hometown. Right? Finally, about April of 1975, I went to a gaming uh, night party at Rick Loomis's house, and I got there late. Everybody was playing Risk. I couldn't mm -hmm. get into the game. But one of them had brought the first edition Tunnels and Tunnels, Dungeons and Dragons in the white box. So I sat down to read this and see what it was really all about. I read it for about an hour. I didn't read the whole thing. I skipped over great sections of it that didn't seem relevant or make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. But when I was done, I, I said, what a wonderful idea. What a terrible way to do it. <laughs> I will go and make a game that I can play. Uh, where am I going to get D8s and D12s and D20s and stuff? It's Phoenix. They didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But D6s were available. We called them regular dice. Exactly. There and was no need to call them D6s. There was no <laughs> need to call them you know, with a number, right? Uh, there was only one kind of dice in the world. It had six sides. It came in Monopoly. All right? uh -huh. so I will go home and make a game that I and my friends can play using six-sided dice. Uh, then I went home uh, full of the idea of making a game, role-playing, uh, storytelling. Uh, I checked out every book I could find about medieval weapons and some of the books about mythology of all sorts to give me an idea for magic. Uh, did research for two or three days and then started writing as fast as I could. Uh, first, we'll have a, we'll make a character. Characters, yeah, attributes are fine for characters. Uh, the, the six that Dungeons and Dragons gave us made a lot of sense to me, mm -hmm. except constitution. Uh, if you already have a constitution, why do we have to roll again to see how many hit points we have? Mm -hmm. Throw that out. Uh, use constitution. You also were into doing favor of moral alignment, right? Right. Uh, alignments didn't make any sense to me. Um, people don't have alignments in the real world. I don't go around saying, I'm lawful good. Yeah. Uh, well, well, maybe now they do, but uh, but we were just people, and it seemed to me that in any fantasy world, uh, they would just be people. So uh, they, were, but they did. The archetypes made sense, you know. Uh, wizards, yeah, you gotta have wizards in a sword and sorcery game. Warriors, yeah. I'm a big fan of Conan. I have like every Conan ever printed, right? Clerics, no. Nobody's done clerics and Charlemagne and uh, uh, and the age of the paladins, right? Yeah. Uh, but we do have ropes. Fritz Leiber's Grey Mouser was a marvelous character, and I wanted characters like that. Right? So those became my three types. Excellent. And I just went through it step by step. What would be logical to me and my friends? And, and 
and you know, I had to, a few days later, I had about eight to ten pages of rules. I called my friends over, we played it. They loved it. They started borrowing my rules, and photocopying it. Every time it came back from being photocopied, it was in worse condition than when it went out. After a week of this, I said, no, stop. You can't mm -hmm. have my rules anymore. I will make a collected edition of all mm -hmm. the rules with all the improvements. Hi, Dan. Uh, and here's the and here's the modern reprint of the first edition, right? Yes. So available by Flying Buffalo. Is From it Flying Buffalo? Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And for only ten dollars. That's good. So it cost one dollar originally. Now, so and this was the second the second role playing game that came out. It came out in seventy five. Yes, wrong, it right? came out in June of nineteen seventy five. Um, I took it over. Uh, one thing I was very proud of in June of nineteen seventy five was putting a copyright notice on mine. Uh -huh. I had paid attention to the title page of the other one. And there was no copyright notice. Huh. So right down in here, uh, there should be a copyright notice. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I... Copyright, June 1975. Here it is. Yeah. And the other guys didn't have it. And they forgot. No. Guy Gazzani's on no that. idea what copyright was, probably. Probably not. <laughs> um, but I was already a librarian. So there you go. And I was planning to be a writer. So anything I wrote that was going to get published in any form got a copyright notice. Uh -huh. Excellent. So um, another thing, actually, so you're the second creator of role-playing games, but you're the first creator, so the real the inventor of solitaire, solitaire role-playing games adventures. And Buffalo Castle was the first one. Buffalo Castle, here we have a new edition, a deluxe edition. At home I have a copy of the first edition. It looks much more modest, much more humble. It's typewritten. It has a plastic spiral here. But that was the first solitaire role-playing game adventure. Yes. You know, tell us about that. How, how did you come up with the idea of like solitaire adventures? There was a small science fiction convention in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. uh, I and several of my friends were going to it. Uh, my friend Steve McAllister was working for aerospace at the time. And he started telling us about programmed instruction for how the mechanics learned to do their jobs in fixing jet planes. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, you could probably do something like that with uh, your game. You could have uh, paragraphs and give people choices of where to go. Steve McAllister invented the solo dungeon. Excellent. That's, okay. Yeah. I, I didn't do it. Yeah. But I know a go good idea when I heard it. I told Rick about it. He knows a good idea when he hears one. Rick came back like a Rick week Loomis later. Here, Tom, Rick Loomis, mm -hmm. standing, sitting right behind you, uh, came back and he said, "Look, I've written this solo adventure." And I went, "Darn, mine isn't finished yet." Uh huh. Uh, so Rick did the first one, and that was Buffalo Castle. Uh huh. I did the second one, which was Death Trap Equalizer. And this is a modern cover. The original cover did not look like this. Mm, no, it does. Uh, can I tell a slightly off-color story about the original? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I don't believe in discriminating between men and women. I never did. Uh, actually, it wasn't Death, death Trap perfectly har harmless. It was Naked Doom that this story yeah. is for. Uh, I told Rob Carver that, you know, uh, the adventure started by having you know, your character uh, run into a dungeon start naked with Bowman shooting at him. So he drew me a picture of a guy, full frontal nudity, uh, running for his life with Bowman trying to shoot arrows at him. Uh, you'll see a modified version of that in the Meta Arcade uh, mm -hmm. production. Uh, and Rick saw that and went, oh no. <laughs> uh, so we drew a loincloth over him. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that one now is available like online. There are several websites that sell it legally, I believe. I mean, that's how I found my copy of Naked Doom. Uh, it's game been out of print for quite a while. Yeah, so, I think RPG now has a cop as a version of that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, but that was that was already like quite interesting idea that you enter the dungeon naked. I guess it was one of those reactions against players that have like the craziest upgrades and weapons and basically become immortal in the game. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, because that stuff takes so long to equip your characters. Yeah. Uh, even in Tunnels and Trolls, which goes pretty fast, mm -hmm. you could wait, spend, you know, an hour getting your character ready to play. Yeah. But if I say the game starts and you've got nothing, except your attributes, bam, we're in the action. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about nudity, I mean, uh, at the time, you, the Buffalo Castle and the first solo were the first interactive books that were published that told stories to people. Then Choose Your Adventures book would come out, and game books like Lone Wolf, Fighting Fantasy would come out. But these were the first ones. Um, and they were clearly meant not for children, but for, for an audience of teenagers or adults, because they did have a sexual element. That is something that the other books did not have. I mean, I remember in the early stories, there were the possibility for the protagonist to have yes, an erotic, I, I an erotic encounter. About a, about a goddess who, if she likes you, uh, will spend the night with you. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't go into graphic, pornographic detail. Uh, we left that to the imagination of the readers. But we were all quite young, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and just loved the idea of having, you know, fantasy heroines uh, treat us nicely. <laughs> then, so that the formula was successful because starting from the late 70s, then you also started recruiting other writers to create modules. And then in the 80s, the solo modules were picked up by by a British publisher, Corgi, and so we have these nice editions here. Again, you're seeing the modern deluxe editions, and these ones, so they look kind of like similar quality, but the original ones were much humbler, and these really look deluxe back in the day when they came out. Can you tell us a little bit about this publication here, when the original modules that were kind of like for role-playing gamers became game books that could be enjoyed also by somebody who had never played Thunders and Trolls before. Well, Corgi came up with the idea mm -hmm. of putting a you know, condensed version of the rules right at the beginning so that they could sell these books in regular stores and bookstores and so on without having to make somebody go to a hobby store and get the entire rule set. And once they put the rules in the front, uh, it only made sense to do something with the rules. Mm -hmm. um, this was an entirely uh, British innovation. And also, they bowdlerized the text because they took out all of those erotic well, yes, elements and made them... Some of our, some of our uh, humor and uh, everyday speech in the 70s and early 80s mm -hmm. was not as politically correct and uh, well informed as it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, we were young. Um, I, my whole idea was to make spell names that were funny. Uh -huh. uh, and um, uh, like many comedians, I had no respect for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I, I made spell names that sounded uh, like a joke. Mm -hmm. Some people never got the joke, and the British quickly took all of those out. Yeah, yeah but that also tells you that, I mean, there was something, Dungeons and Dragons was, was Dungeons and Dragons took itself much more seriously. Clearly in Thunders of Trolls there was this idea of having fun, or laughing with your friends, there was a certain freshness, a certain directness that was different from other role-playing games. I hope time. so, because you know, you've been talking to me for a while, Marco, you know, I'm a bit of a comedian, you know, mm -hmm. I like to make people laugh and smile. Uh, I, I work jokes in about uh, lots of things, including myself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I wanted a game that would be fun to play. Uh, and uh, a way to do that with, with this was to make Tunnels and Trolls a storytelling game 
Uh, and you can tell stories with anachronisms and things that don't quite fit. Uh -huh. It was never a simulation. Okay, it was a, meant to be a storytelling game, uh, based more on comic books. And in those days, comic books included real comic characters, you know. You're just as likely to buy a Bugs Bunny book as a Spider-Man book. Mm -hmm. Not well. Yes, absolutely. And, and this is also why some of the early stories, like Death Trap, Equalizer, some of these early ones, they do not, or Buffalo Castle, they do not have a strong plot. The point wasn't to go and defeat the wizards. They are sort of like fun romps, which are just a sequence of strange episodes and strange things that happen to you. I mean, Death Trap, Equalizer, you're just randomly teleported in various locations and you do not know what's going to happen next. This was based on the idea of a fun house. Uh huh. Right? Uh, you buy your ticket at the door, uh, you go into the fun house, you see the distorting mirrors, and you ride the crazy rides, and you come back out, and so on. Except this is a fantasy world fun house where uh, you might get killed. Actually, there is one of the later ones, uh, I don't remember the title, it must be the fourth or the fifth, that has like a fun house as an illustration. It's one of the first illustrations in, I remember that. So that definitely there is that feeling of, you know, you go in and you, who knows what happens and it's just fun, fun to simply see what happens next. Uh, now, Tunnels and Trolls stories and Solitaire Adventures are still being published, being written, are the new ones that are coming out? Yes. Uh, there are, and from more sources than I can tell you here in, in one quick interview. So, uh, Tunnels and Trolls was always meant to be the fans' game. One of the main rules is the game master is always right. If the game master tells you to make a second level saving roll, uh, but you think the second level is too hard, uh -huh. uh, you might argue with him, but he gets the final say. You can't point to the rule and say, in these situations, only a first level saving roll is justified. Right? Yep. And if the game master says, um, uh, the goddess Athena comes down from on high, you know, taps you on the head and says, you're now twice as smart as you used to be, well, lucky you, you're twice as smart as you used to be because mm -hmm. the game master gave it to you. Um, and players were always meant to make their own adventures. Of course there will come a time when people would want to not only make their own adventures, but to share them. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, everything doesn't have to be published by Flying Buffalo. Uh, all we ask is that you respect our trademark and say, you know, Tunnels and Trolls was originally created by Ken St. Andre, and trademarked by Flying Buffalo. Uh, if you do that, I'm fine with it. Uh, we do hope you will be uh, tasteful mm -hmm. and innovative and make games that are fun for people to play. There have been some really bad ones in the past and they have vanished without a trace, I hope. <laughs> and what is your favorite Tunnels and Trolls soul adventure? Right now, I'm going to have to say, I told you originally that it was... Mm -hmm. um, Agent of Death. And Agent of Death might be my favorite because this is the equivalent of a Tunnels and Trolls novel. Uh -huh. It's a longer... It's, it is the longest uh -huh. TNT solo ever made, at least that I know of. It's 350 paragraphs. The same length of the Lone Wolf game box that we're all... 350. Really? 350 yep. paragraphs? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. This is the longest one I've written. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and those were some of the longest too, so that's... You're there with the, and, with the long and riders. this is a, an amazing adventure that takes you through several different locales. Uh, but perhaps my real favorite right now is the one that I just finished doing for Meta Arcade. Uh, where they asked me to write a uh, solo adventure featuring Grimtooth. Uh -huh. And I came up with an idea where Grimtooth needs uh, a guard to help him with an adventure. But Steve Crompton, my artist, said, why don't you use Grimtina instead? Because Grimtooth wouldn't need any guards. Mm -hmm. And he was right. Uh, so we made uh, Grimtina's guard. And this is an adventure where you have to uh, guard uh, the big troll's little sister on a perilous journey.
And you told me, without spoilers, that there is something here with the companion character that... Grim Tina is the companion character. And there's something that hasn't been done before with this character. Uh, I think so. Uh, I think I have another innovation in here that you've never seen in a solo adventure before. Well, I'm very curious to try the adventure now. Thank you so much, Ken, for taking the time to chat with me and to share some of your ideas and memories with me and with my viewers. Thank you, Marco. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.